we decided in advance of the publication of Catalog 61 in September of 2011 to do uh, video segments as a kind of supplement to our written catalog and uh, internet descriptions. Um, we've done a, a, more than a dozen. Uh, this is the longest and the m broadest. It's a kind of general introduction uh, dealing with the collecting of books. Um, I've been buying and selling and appraising books for 35 years, and I think I could be forgiven if I have a kind of world-weary or hard-bitten demeanor, but the truth is book selling for me has been a great deal of fun. And I mention that because uh, book selling and book collecting, in my opinion, um, are basically the same kind of undertaking, and they have the same kind of pleasure. And fun is at the heart of both things. Um, I want to divide these uh, general uh, principles, this discussion of general ideas, into four parts. I promise that they'll be short on abstraction, long on exemplification, looking at examples of the principles I'm talking about. Um, it's going to be superficial because it's, we don't have a great deal of time. Um, but if you're willing to listen, uh, you get to look at the, at the good things. Um, that will serve as examples. The four parts of, of this introductory uh, discussion. Why do people collect anything? Why do people collect books? How do people collect books? And what is my role as the facilitator um, for people who collect? Because the truth is, I don't really collect much in the way of books. First thing. Why do people collect anything? Uh, there are lots of answers to that question. Uh, one of them is that we live in a world that is full of disorder, and it's extremely scary. And collecting allows you to kind of impose a certain, I'm sorry, artificial order. Now, this is a, this is a frightening kind of area, and I don't want to go there, so we won't talk about it. Second reason uh, for collecting anything any kind of collectible, um, it puts you in touch with history. Um, the first opportunity I had to experience this uh, feeling was when I was in my 20s. Uh, I lived in Iowa, and I used to walk in the spring uh, in the fields after the first plowing, after the first heavy rain, and I would find uh, aboriginal artifacts like this incredibly beautiful um, axe head. And I would reach across time, 2,000 years, sometimes 6,000 years, because some of the uh, artifacts were that old. And to be able to um, make contact with somebody from that uh, age is, is a feeling that's very difficult to replicate. I had no idea that I would end up being an antiquarian bookseller, uh, but the feeling I get selling books is very much akin to that and it's a wonderful feeling to have. The third reason to collect uh, is it allows you to be creative in a personal way. Every collection, no matter what it is, reflects your personality. And the fourth reason, I think, to collect, uh, that I want to talk about anyway, is that it's, um, it's collaborative, it's collegial. Yes, there probably are recluses who don't want people to see their collections, and who do scholarly research only on their own. But that's um, an exception um, that you don't see very often. And in my own work and, and in any serious collector's um, activity, there's always sharing either in trying to find out the story of what it is that you're collecting or in, in sharing the treasures that you found. Now, why collect books? rather than oil rags. I mention oil rags because you're not going to believe this, but I'm not making it up. Uh, I read a, a story in the Des Moines Register. Des Moines Register has won important journalistic um, awards. It's not a podunk paper. But I read a story once about a man who collected oil rags, and I couldn't believe it. Um, but when I, I remember this a long time ago, uh, being impressed that if a person can be serious about collecting oil rags, they can collect anything. Anyway, why collect books rather than oil rags or, or porcelain or whatever? Um, number one, there's a long-established 
history of collecting books. Sotheby's, which now, you know, auctions off Jackie Onassis's uh, jewels, started out selling books only in the first 40 years of their existence. That's all they sold. Second, uh, books are seriously undervalued. Uh, you can take $10,000 or $1,000 or $100, whatever level you're able to take, and you can buy more uh, in in the book area, you can buy better uh, material in the book area than in just about any other kind of um, seriously pursued collectible. Third, and I think maybe most important, books have um, a second dimension. They have an intellectual dimension that furniture doesn't have. I mean, you can sit on furniture, you can't sit on books unless they're really big. Um, but a book is an object uh, but at the same time, it's full of ideas. It's intellectual property. Um, so you're getting two things for the price of one. The third thing, how people collect. It's a big topic. I can only talk about a very tiny part of it. People collect authors, author groups like the Bloomsbury Group, uh, genres uh, like Bible, science fiction, books about women, natural history. Um, I have always felt like I wanted not to exclude myself from any particular area or, or author or period. And so uh, from the beginning, I've looked for whatever I thought uh, I would like and, frankly, that was, was saleable. Um, this also gives me a wonderful excuse for not knowing what I'm doing because I can always say, hey, I'm a generalist. How am I supposed to know about ninth century scriptoria in tour? You know, it's just, I can be excused. But anyway, as years have gone along, um, I have had to uh, specialize in a certain way. And if God said all I could do was one thing, it would be bindings. And or to be slightly broader, the book as a physical object. So my remarks have to be understood, um, knowing that I'm interested in the book as a beautiful thing uh, in terms of its uh, binding, in terms of its illustrations, in terms of its texture, and then also uh, in its connection uh, with history. So those two things, um, I'm searching always for something that's beautiful, something that's connecting um, to history. And I'm doing the same thing that collectors do. I'm finding things. I'm finding out what I've found. In other words, I'm finding the story uh, behind it uh, or residing in it. And uh, as a result, I'm creating value. Even if I don't mean to, I am. Fourth thing, and then we'll get to some examples. Uh, I want to talk about my role as a facilitator. I mentioned I don't really collect books. That's not quite true. Um, when a person collects books, the books are, in a way, his or her children. For me, the books are foster children. Um, I get to keep them. Sometimes I don't want to give them up. Um, the bank sends me a statement every month. That helps me. Um, but in any case, I find books. That's my job, to find good books. Um, I'm, I'm too old and too tired uh, and have always been too limited in staff uh, to want to run a walk-in uh, bookshop or, or to a big operation. So I try to find uh, good things. The second thing I do as a facilitator is I try to describe the things I've found in an interesting way and in an honest way. Um, third thing is I try to find good homes for them. Okay. I'm not going to turn anybody's money away. If they want to buy a book, I'm not going to say, no, you can't have it. But what I can do is when I get a book that I know would be perfect for somebody's collection, um, I let the person know. And, I, and that way, um, you know, we collaborate on, on building uh, libraries. And finally, I try to make sure that people don't make unwise investments. Um, books are not, in my opinion, uh, they ought not to be considered as investments because for, um, to, for books to realize the kind of return that you might see in, in other sorts of more legitimate uh, investments, you have to hold them for a long time. 
uh, like 10 years really to feel like you're going to be sure to get your money back. But there's no reason why um, you, a, a collector shouldn't buy things that will hold their value or that will increase. And as in so many cases, with so many kinds of collectibles, I try to buy things that are the best you can buy, the best copy, the most interesting copy, the book, uh, the copy with the best story. Now, as an example of uh, connecting with history, I wrote a dissertation at the University of Michigan on restoration comedy, uh, plays that were produced in London in the 1660s. The theaters had just been reopened after the interregnum. Actresses were on the stage for the first time. It was a really um, strange and, and, in a way, brutal and wonderful time. Uh, London was falling apart. The town burned down. People were dying from the plague. And a man named Samuel Pepys, who was the uh, secretary of the Admiral, Admiralty, um, wrote a, a diary, kept a diary for 10 years. And I read the, every word um, as background for the dissertation I was doing. Ever since then, I've had a personal connection with Pepys's diary. Uh, here are three editions. Uh, Pepys's diary is not difficult to find, but it... Um, is difficult to find in, in a really attractive uh, copy. This is a um, mid-19th century uh, five-volume set bound by a, a company called Jenkins and Cecil, and it's bound in attractive tree calf, treated with acid so it actually looks kind of like a, a tree. Um, undistinguished except in beautiful condition um, and uh, looks attractive on the shelf. This is a larger... Um, uh, format edition and this is an edition that's important because it's the first edition where um, Pepys's uh, account was decoded. He told about historical events including going to the theater but he also wrote about his encounters with young women. Uh, he was a, a, a hopeless womanizer and he uh, imposed familiarities on one shop girl and tavern girl and street girl after another, uh, always showing a kind of um, f sexual ineptness. Um, and he put the account of these encounters in a code. And uh, it was only in the latter part of the 19th century that a clergyman actually uh, decoded uh, what he had said. And this is the first appearance um, of that uh, particular text. And it's interesting for that reason. It's also interesting because of the binding uh, by Bainton, uh, very nice strap work design, uh, which is very antique. Um, and it's interesting because it's extra illustrated. Uh, in addition to the text, inserted into it are, are plates showing um, the people who uh, are important in the narrative, including a, a portrait of Pepys. You can see he was not a terribly uh, what shall I say, debonair kind of guy, not the kind of person who would necessarily um, attract women. Uh, and then finally, uh, the third set I have is interesting mainly because it's um, um, compact. It's three volumes in a lovely Sangorsky binding, but it is uh, done on India paper and you can stick it in a small place. Bibles is a category of uh, collectible books that uh, a lot of people uh, are interested in. Um, people collect Bibles because of their religious faith, but for other reasons as well. A good friend of mine uh, decided to begin his collecting of antiquarian books with Bibles because he said they were the world's best bestseller. And in fact, that's the case. I have three here. Um, just as, as examples from my current inventory, this one, um, two-volume set, uh, published in uh, Edinburgh, 1752. Um, it's of interest mainly because of uh, its condition and, and its decoration. It's, um, there were two distinctive kinds of binding styles uh, done in Scotland at this time. Uh, one of them is called the herringbone um, uh, design, and this is a perfect ex example of this. The, the persons who have owned this Bible over the years have not used it as a, 
a tool for the the expression of their devotion, but instead have used it, uh, actually have cherished it as a little um, treasure. And I'm grateful that they did. This um, 19th century, mid 19th century Bible um, is ornate. Uh, uh, like the other two Bibles here, it's in remarkable condition because Bibles tend to be a wreck. Uh, they tend to be read to death because most people who buy Bibles use them, uh, use them regularly. Um, and uh, this Bible is distinguished and distinctive because of its scholarly apparatus. Um, so many Bibles are of importance to their owners because of uh, the notes uh, or the, um, the scholarly uh, apparatus that comes with it. This has a half a million, I'm not making it up, a half a million uh, marginal references or, uh, or notes. In addition to the ornate binding, in addition to the plethora of scholarly annotations, this volume has a, a wonderful surprise when you fan out the vast foredge you see revealed, uh, a teeming scene of the Thames full of vessels painted by a man named Martin Frost. And finally, the large fellow here uh, is one volume of seven of the uh, Macklin Bible, which is the most prodigious uh, edition of scripture in English. Six volumes printed in uh, 1800, uh, the Apocrypha in 1816. Um, it's a big picture book, um, and because the, the illustrations are uh, full of interest, the book is normally found in dreadful condition. This one, obviously, is not in dreadful condition. Uh, and in addition to the fact that it's remarkably well preserved, its binding is of very considerable interest. It's a, a very good example of an early neoclassical binding, uh, which was a style just uh, coming into vogue at the time uh, that the binding was done. Um, in England, uh, two binders named Stagemeyer and Velker uh, were popularizing the neoclassical binding. Uh, in Stockholm, there was a guy named uh, Standlander. And in Vienna, there was a binder named Georg Friedrich Kraus. And he's the man who did this binding. Um, we know this by inference because it was done for Duke Albrecht of Saxetetian. And his monogram, A.S., is on each of the spine compartments. Um, now, Albrecht, uh, Saxetetian, Albrecht of Saxetetian married one of uh, the Empress Maria Theresa's daughters, and it was her favorite daughter. Another not-so-favorite daughter was um, Marie Antoinette. And um, he married the daughter, the only daughter that the Empress allowed to marry for love. And uh, they were given the duchy of Teschen, uh, which was a nice plum. And the man was uh, obviously uh, very rich, and he, he put together a, a wonderful library. Uh, he also founded the Albertina Museum, which now is the uh, museum with the largest number of prints in the world. Uh, one other thing about this particular set, the Macklin Bible is an English thing, and for it to appear in um, a binding that was done for a, a German duke, and this kind of money lavished on a binding like that, indicates that uh, it was obviously a book that had interest outside of the British Isles. The best example of connecting with history and finding something beautiful uh, currently in my inventory is this uh, 18th century edition of Orlando Furioso by Ariosto. Uh, it's a singular and bizarre narrative, 50,000 lines long, 26 years in the making, and it's, um, it provides a, a vehicle for uh, imagination uh, when it comes to illustration. And through the years, um, it, is, it has uh, been produced as an illustrated book uh, at various places and various times. This set was printed by John Baskerville, a uh, famous Birmingham uh, printer, but it was done for uh, an Italian publisher, and it was illustrated by French uh, artists and engravers. 
So this is a, a, a very good example of the conjunction of uh, several sources of pleasure um, involving at least three locations, Italy, France, and England. Um, the printer, uh, John Baskerville, was in a way a, a private press printer. He put out books that uh, were issued in limited uh, numbers and were always beautifully um, designed and uh, printed with great care. And they're always beautiful objects in terms of typography and, and layout. The book was bound by uh, Jerome Lejeune, uh, Jerome the Younger. There were 17 binders in the Jerome family over a long period of time, but Jerome Lejeune was the one who was at the top of the heap. Um, sometimes his bindings are extraordinarily decorative. Sometimes they're just um, elegantly simple, and that's the case uh, with this binding. We know it's by him because it has his ticket in it um, with his address. Uh, so often bindings are uh, ascribed to Jerome when in fact it's, it's just a guess this time we know. And the illustrations um, are wonderful. They're by a, a series of um, French artists and designers. Um, and so with the binding and the uh, and the printer and the illustrator, uh, you've got three wonderful reasons to buy this uh, and cherish this set. Finally, it was uh, originally bound for uh, the Earl of Clare, who was the Chancellor uh, of Ireland uh, at the end of the 18th century. So it has a distinguished provenance as well as uh, a wonderful binding um, and an important printer and illustrators being involved. As a final part to this introductory segment, um, I want to talk about, more specifically, uh, creating value. Now, value to me and creating it uh, is important because I am concerned about profit. Uh, the book collector himself is not necessarily involved with that, but um, nevertheless, it's important that uh, a collector find out as much as he can, he or she can, about um, what book, uh, what the, the story of the book he owns uh, is. And that's where uh, create, creating value comes in. It's an inevitable result of simply coming to understand uh, what it is that you own. I have three books here. Uh, in, most, in most cases with, with uh, uh, books that we get in our inventory, the uncovering of value is basically uh, straightforward. Occasionally we are able to find a story that someone else wouldn't have found and that of course always gives us special pleasure. Um, this is a book that uh, is a collection of um, symbolist poetry and uh, it is a wonderful binding uh, that I actually talk about in a different segment um, that has a doubloor, uh, a leather-covered uh, inside front cover, with an image that is puzzling. It looks like a moon rising um, with a censer full of incense, with smoke uh, coming up in ribbons up towards the top. Um, and... I had no idea, uh, when I looked at the binding, what this could mean. And so I asked um, my chief cataloger, uh, Koki Anderson, can you figure out uh, what this could possibly represent? And she didn't have to go very far. And again, as I said, finding out the stories of, um, of your books is sometimes quite straightforward. She didn't have to go very far, but she turned to the first page. Um, and there's a poem by Edgar Allan Poe, or an excerpt from Edgar Allan Poe's poem. Uh, was it not fate that on this July midnight, was it not fate, uh, whose name is also sorrow, that bade me pause before the garden gate to breathe the incense of those slumbering roses? And um, around the outside of the doubloor, are roses, which appear to be slumbering. Um, easy enough to create value there. 
it's a pretty binding, but if you can tie this binding um, on a book by a French symbolist that, frankly, a lot of Americans don't know, um, to Al Edgar Allan Poe, suddenly uh, the book has a wider audience, a wider appeal, a wider interest, has a in more interesting story. So we can learn from that example uh, that to understand the story behind the book that you own, you have to take a look at it. Um, this is a better example. This is a book that I bought in a lot uh, at auction um, because I thought there might be a hidden treasure here. Uh, I bought it at a London auction even though I didn't attend, but uh, I suspected that uh, although it, it's a pretty binding, there might be more to it. It's a book by a man named Thomas More, ninth, 19th century friend of Byron's, called Lala Rook. And Lala Rook is a, is a title that oftentimes is decorated with a four-edge painting, a painting along the four-edge. And the auction house did not think that there could possibly be a four-edge painting here because the four-edge is gophered. It's um, decorated with little gouges, with little carvings, and this would normally make it uh, make a four-edge painting indistinct. But when the book arrived, I said to myself, what's it going to hurt to fan out the four-edge and see if there might possibly be a painting underneath? And son of a gun, there is. Final example, um, and this involves a little bit of experience. I mentioned that I've been selling books for 35 years, and if you sell books for that long and you have a computer where you record things, um, chances are that you build up a kind of experience that could come, into ha could come in handy. This is a, an amateur binding uh, on a, a book by Tolstoy called Resurrection. It's full of gilt decoration, um, not done with tremendous precision, but still a pretty book. At the front, there's an inscription. Uh, to Molly at Christmas from Margot. And then underneath, in a different hand, probably in the hand of the recipient, it says, hand-bound, designed, and tooled by Margot, and then we can't read the name, something like Laufede, uh, aged 19 years, Tudor Miss White, W-H-Y-T-E. And that little phrase, tutor, Miss White, you know, she, she was the one who tutored Margot. Um, that opened a door that someone else might not have known how to open. Um, because we know that Miss White has to be Madeline White. Madeline White was the only uh, female student of uh, Thomas J. Cobden Sanderson, the most important um, uh, figure in, in the history of modern English bookbinding. Um, he taught, he tried to te teach his daughter Stella. She was not interested. Madeline White was his only pupil. Um, after she uh, worked with him, she went on to teach bookbinding in uh, St. Andrews. And it's clear that um, Margot, whoever, was a student of hers. And so instead of having a, a kind of interesting amateur binding, we've got an interesting amateur binding that has a connection to um, a grand figure in the history of bookbinding. I mentioned in, earlier in this general discussion about why people collect books and how they collect books, the idea of uh, collegiality or, collo of col or collaboration. And it's important for me to state uh, what a lot of book collectors and book dealers know already, um, that it's not what you know that allows you to su succeed as a bookseller or collector, but it's who you know who can tell you what it is that you don't know, but that maybe you suspect. When I saw this leaf as part of um, the structure of a book, of a later binding, um, my instincts told me that, it, it should, uh, that I should buy it. I knew from my experience that it was early. I couldn't have said that it was the ninth century, that it was from the ninth century. It was certainly before the 13th century, certainly before the 12th century, but then my experience doesn't 
um, give me the, the right answers. And that's where I turn to my colleagues. And that's where collegiality and collaboration come in. That's where I call uh, Professor Edwin Hall, a retired professor of um, medieval history at Wayne State University in Detroit. That's where I send an email to Christopher DeHamel and to Tim Bolton, who work for the Illuminated Manuscripts Department in Sotheby's. And then I get to the bottom of the issue. Then I have the questions answered. And um, it's important to, un to state, and, and, and I'm sure many people are already going to understand this, but um, I'm not a, a person who's operating uh, on his own. I, I will die knowing less than 10 percent of what I ought to know as a, as a bookseller, and particularly about um, early uh, medieval and Renaissance manuscripts. This is material that I find terribly romantic, terribly uh, fascinating, partly because there's so much to learn, partly because there's so little that at this point I know, and that's when I rely on colleagues who um, are, are generous beyond description in giving of their time and expertise.